This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More about them in a bit. Somewhere in Europe, early 14th century AD, the skies are permanently overcast and a grey shroud extends from the Pyrenees to the Danube. The land below is barren, sodden in a rotten pulp of decomposed wheat stalks. In between heaven and earth, once thriving cities, towns and villages are now drained of all life, hope and compassion. Parents and children are sitting in front of an empty table. Their dishes were empty yesterday and the days before yesterday. It doesn't take much, only one crop to fail for starvation to set in. When the body starves, rationality enters into a slumber, and the sleep of reason produces monsters. Parents and children are staring at each other across an empty table. Someone's hand grips a knife. Perhaps tomorrow their plates will be filled with something or someone. Elsewhere, someone else incapable of slaying their kin is frantically digging, opening up a freshly closed grave. This is the great European famine of the 14th century. Food is nowhere to be found, and what remains of humanity is slowly fading away. Even the corpses will do to survive until tomorrow. Medieval Europe was no strange to the raids of the Four Horsemen, described in the Book of Revelations. Pestilence, war, famine, and death. But the 14th century was especially prolific. The continent was ravaged by large-scale conflicts such as the Hundred Years' War. It was annihilated by the plague pandemics known as the Black Death and the Plague of Children. But the first great catastrophe of the century was the Great Famine of 1315 to 1322, a cataclysm of traumatic proportions which starved millions of inhabitants, especially in northern Europe, and set the stage for the later crises of the era. And to think that at the start of the 14th century, Europeans were doing pretty good. There had been a revival of commerce and trade amongst European kingdoms, and even with lands beyond Europe. As a consequence, living conditions had improved for most families, with better quality of life, access to more food and higher income. Couples tended to have more children who could enjoy a longer life expectancy compared to previous generations. Population started to grow, which rulers saw as a positive sign. The more people that were around meant that more taxes could be levied and more soldiers could be recruited. But this positive developments carried the seed of future destruction. Trade was thriving, certainly, but not enough to keep up with the exponential growth of the population. Imports of grains and other foodstuffs from the bread baskets of North Africa and Southern Italy were not consistent and reliable enough to cater for all these new mouths to feed. Both merchants and individual families had not yet perfected the art of storing and stocking certain provisions for longer than a season. By the 1310s, most lands in Europe were dangerously approaching their maximum sustainable population levels. The most accurate demographic records of that time were kept in England and France. In 1315, these kingdoms had 4.7 million and 16.7 million subjects, respectively. Their maximum sustainable population at that time had been estimated at 5 million and 20 million. With these conditions, it would have just taken one abnormal event to unsettle the balance and create a perfect storm of high demand and extremely low food supply. That abnormal event materialized in the spring of 1315, when a season of incessant rains of biblical proportions fell upon the heads of oblivious Europeans. When Bob Dylan sung about a hard rain that was going to fall, he mentioned how he had stumbled on the sides of twelve misty mountains. But it may have taken only one misty mountain to alter climate patterns in Western Europe, the mountain located on the other side of the world. According to Dr. Michael Pumer of the Center for Climate Systems Research at Columbia University, the 1315 floods may have been linked to the 1314 eruption of Mount Tarawera in New Zealand. The enormous clouds of smoke and ashes released into the atmosphere may have created the anomalous conditions for the torrential downpours. Historical records first mention heavy rains falling over France in April 1315. The following month, it started raining in England, and it didn't stop until autumn. The counties of Yorkshire and Nottingham 
Nottinghamshire were entirely flooded, and the royal manor of Milton near Kingston upon Hull was described as being completely covered in water. By September 1315, the floods moved westward into Germany. We know this thanks to the description of a battle in Augsburg. Cavalry actions were hindered by the torrential waters which had reached the saddles of the war horses. At the same time, a church near Leipzig was entirely swept away by an overflowing river, resulting in many deaths. As bad as it sounds, no one had it worse than the Low Countries, i.e. modern-day Belgium and the Netherlands. To give us an idea, here is another military account. On the 6th of September 1315, King Louis X of France led an invading force against Count Robert of Flanders. The king and his allies had devised the perfect plan, cutting off Robert from accessing the sea to the north and his allies to the south. But after one week, the invasion force melted away and withdrew to France. The reason? Again, incessant rain, which turned the Low Countries into an endless swampy bog in which men and horses alike slowly drowned in mud. Think Artax in the Swamp of Sadness. These historical descriptions of perpetually cloudy, weeping skies has been corroborated by the Old World Drought Atlas, a database which estimates soil moisture conditions based on analysis of tree rings. The atlas shows that the climate was unnaturally wet over much of Europe as early as 1314. The wettest areas recorded included the British Isles, Western and Central Europe, the Baltic countries, Denmark, and Poland's. According to the Atlas, the summers of 1315 and 1316 ranked among the five wettest summers of a period between 1300 and 2012. Such a climate had an obvious impact on agriculture. The rains absolutely devastated the production of wine, a major export of both France and the German territories. Moreover, the lack of sun crippled the production of salt by evaporation, a florid industry in western France. And the main use of salt at the time was as a meat preservative, therefore hindering all efforts to build reserves of protein-rich food. Okay, we'll get back to today's video in just a second, but first a quick word from today's sponsor Squarespace. This is the age of creation thing Think about it, everyone's out there on the internet making something. You've either got a great idea yourself or you probably know someone who does. And when it's time to move that brilliant idea from your brain to the screen, well, that's where Squarespace comes in. It's the perfect web tool to help you fashion the internet into whatever you want it to be. Maybe the hands-on site, lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your website should look like. If so, very cool. Squarespace gives you all of the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical nonsense to worry about. Or maybe you just need something functional, something that works with minimal thoughts. Well, just use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's both fresh and simple and for you. And once you're done setting up your website, locking in the name, maybe playing with the design a little bit, well, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so that your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analysis, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, deep breath, everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, you gotta do it with Squarespace. Right now you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back into it. To recap, the cold, wet summer of 1315 destroyed the production of wine and salty ham. So far, it sounds as though only rich merchants heading to the town square for tapas would be impacted. But the wet climate was also disastrous for grain crops, a staple that most people relied on. The summer wheat crop failed completely as a direct consequence of the weather. The lack of sun also prevented spelt and rye seeds from reaching maturity, and they could not be sown in autumn. The following spring, the soil was too wet to allow for effective sowing. Memorial and monastic accounts in England demonstrate that the wheat yields were 30% lower than average in 1315, 40% lower than average in 1316, and 10% lower than average in 1317. Rye yields suffered a similar fate, down by one-fifth in 1315 and by more than a third in 1316 and 1317. As is often the case, the scarcity of food led to hoarding by those who could afford it. Records of the wealthy Norwich Cathedral Priory show that the local authorities managed to secure steady imports of grains from other counties, or even from abroad. As a result, wealthy locals barely suffered the effects of the famine. These buying patterns naturally generated inflation. To give you an example, in 1313, a measure of wheat in England cost five shillings. By June of 1315, it sold for 40 shillings. 
Similar price hikes were reported in France, the Low Countries, and other territories, indicating a quasi-universal crop failure which excluded only the Iberian Peninsula and southern Italy. As you might have guessed, the two-pronged attack of insufficient food production and rising prices led to further starvation amongst the poorer rungs of society. English Benedictine monk John of Trocolo left a vivid account of the Great Famine in England. He tells of how the poorest families had to feed off roots, leaves, dogs, cats, and even the dung of doves. In some areas, hunger bit so hard on sanity that families resorted to eating their own children. These children were the ultimate sacrifice to ensure the survival of the few. Cannibalism may have been an exception amongst households in English towns, but it became a common occurrence in prisons. Hardened criminals were often neglected and left to die of hunger in their cells. When new prisoners were thrown into the jail, they were at serious risk of being devoured alive by the other occupants. Stories of cannibalism were also widespread in the Baltic area, in Livonia, modern-day Latvia and Estonia, starving mothers had to eat their own babies. Men reduced to walking skeletons, took to desecrating graveyards and exhuming corpses so they could eat their flesh, only to die from exhaustion upon the open tombs. Starvation took its toll. Florentine historian Giovanni Villani, writing in the 1320s, estimated that in 1316 a third of the population had died in the areas affected by the famine. Certain areas may have suffered a death rate as high as 50%. Take for example the memorial stone at the church of Schidmerstedt near Erfurt, modern-day Germany. The engraving commemorates the terrible losses suffered by a single community. In the year of the Lord 1316, here were buried 100 by 60, 33 by 60, and five humans who have died in the year years of dearness. God have mercy on them. That makes 7,985 casualties in a town that counted 15 to 18,000 inhabitants throughout most of the Middle Ages. But thankfully, Erfurt may have been an outlier. Historical records agree that the floods and hunger were nowhere worse than in the Low Countries. A rare surviving record from the town of Ypres, modern-day Belgium, calculates the local death toll to be at least 2,794 from May to November 1316. That's approximately a tenth of the inhabitants. So, 10% is definitely a more realistic mortality rate than 33 or 50%, but even so, we're talking about millions of children, women, and men slowly fading into skeletal forms over just a few months. Chroniclers in England, France, and the Low Countries and Thuringia consistently describe how city streets were strewn with corpses felled by malnourishment, and how cemeteries were not large enough to accommodate all the dead. City authorities dug large mass graves outside towns, horrific trenches that nobody bothered to close as new bodies would be dumped in there every day. This made for unsanitary conditions, which naturally contributed to the spread of dysentery and other infectious diseases, leading to further death. Panic spread throughout Europe. The rudimentary scientific knowledge of the time certainly couldn't help, so God-fearing people responded by clinging to religion. The Archbishop of Canterbury ordered the barefoot processions to be staged every Friday, carrying sacred relics to the Church of the Holy Trinity. Similar spectacles were recorded in France and likely took place all over Europe. The not-so-God-fearing subjects resorted to crime instead. The most widespread crime was food adulteration. In Paris, for example, some ingenious bakers were found guilty of mixing bread with hog dung due to the lack of grain. Instead of rewarding the improvisational skills of these poor sods, authorities had them banished. Other honest individuals, devoured by their own empty stomachs, turned to violence, robbery, and murder to steal what little food they could lay their hands on. Many of these impoverished criminals became rather organized with time even resorting to piracy. Pirates were a scourge, especially in the English Channel. These medieval rapscallions did not target merchant ships to fill their booties with florins, but simply to fill their bellies with flour. You see, since December of 1315, King Edward had arranged for Genoese merchants to import grains from their lands. Geophysicist Neville Brown argued that the famine did not affect Italy, despite branding the climate crises as Dantean anomaly in honor of the Florentine poet Dante Alighieri. Nonetheless, Signor Villani reported how, in 1315, rains had spoiled the grain and wine harvest season in northern Italy. Villani also mentions an unidentified pestilence spreading from Florence to the Adriatic coast. But Genoa, despite being located in northern Italy, was not as badly hit. In fact, its business-savvy merchant fleet was able to profit from the whole situation. Genoese traders became the lifeline between the still florid fields and granaries of Sicily and Apulia and the starving populations of northern Europe. All uh, to profit, of course. The Genoese vessels became a coveted target for hungry, 
improvised pirates. This prompted King Edward to raise a special coast guard for the protection of his imports, or in his words, for the repulse of certain malefactors who have committed manslaughter and other enormities on the sea. This was not Edward's only military concern at the time. In the summer of 1316, the monarch was preparing a campaign against the Scots, already hammered by his dad. In 1316, Edward ordered for large amounts of grains to be hoarded for his garrison in Berwick, without which he could not carry out an invasion. In February of 1317, he was still waiting for that cereal to arrive. The irony is that August of 1316 had yielded a good enough harvest in England and Western Europe, but poor Edward later discovered that provisions that could have been retrieved from northern England had been hogged by conmen posing as military procurers. Eastern Europe, on the other hand, did not experience any relief. Heavy rains, especially around the Danube, continued to pound at the sodden earth until 1317. The Danube overflowed that year, destroying much of the grain crops. The same pattern repeated. A cycle of poor weather followed by food scarcity, hyperinflation, and desperation. The Swiss chronicler John of Winterthur gives us an idea of how hopeless the situation had become. He tells a story of how a mass of starving people boarded a ferry to cross the Danube, hoping to find fertile lands in Hungary. But the captain of the ship knew that the Hungarian plains could not offer any sustenance to those migrants, reasoning that their presence would only have heightened the misery of Hungarians. The captain had his passengers thrown overboard to drown in the sweltering Danube. Further north, in the lands of Poland and Silesia, the great starvation persisted until 1319. In these areas, too, chroniclers recorded tales of parents driven by desperation to kill their children. And even the opposite could happen, young children killing their weakened parents so they could feast on their flesh. Amongst a backdrop of families cannibalizing themselves, the execution of criminals was a happy occurrence. As soon as they were left hanging from the noose, citizens would rush to the gallows to snatch their bodies. By the end of 1319, it appears as though the famine, due to the scarcity of grain, had been left behind across most of Europe. But to misappropriate the Gospel of Matthew, man shall not live on bread alone. Medieval communities did not sustain themselves simply on bread and grain products, but relied on cattle as a source of protein. Sure, eating meat was a luxury for aristocrats, rich merchants, and high-ranking clergy, but dairy products were more affordable. In a parallel to the Great Floods and the Great Famine, Northern Europe was ravaged by a cattle plague from 1315 to 1321. This was described in chronicles as moraine, which more or less means just, well, death. In scientific terms, the livestock disease was rinderpest, a viral disease affecting bovine which was eradicated in 2011. The origins of the pestilence are unclear, but it is likely that its unstoppable spread was facilitated by the destruction of hay and straw by the endless downpours. As a result, the bovine populations grew malnourished and their immune systems could not cope with the moraine. Those animals who did not die immediately grew up weak, sterile, and prone to miscarriages. Recorded figures for England and Wales show that 63% of cattle died from April 1319 to September 1320. If you combine this mortality with the one of cattle herders and farmers, it's clear that it took until the late 1330s to replenish the shortages of cattle to pre-flood levels. The immediate impact was that at least one generation of Europeans were deprived of dairy products, one of the main sources of protein and minerals in their diet. And one of the most worrying consequences of malnutrition and reduced protein intake is a weakening of the immune system. Europe was no stranger to infectious diseases, and even during the famine, communities had to cope with their fair share of unspecified pestilences. But the generation which painfully emerged from the Great Starvation would soon have to face the fiercest pandemic yet, the Black Death of the 1340s. And that, friends, is for another video. I really hope you enjoyed today's video, though. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.